but the devil will be allowed to to do something. And if you bow, you might never get back up. But if you stand true for the Lord, your faith will be tested. God will meet you there. Book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. And uh, folks at home, open up to the book of Daniel. It's to the right of the book of Psalms and Proverbs. You'll find it there after Isaiah and Jeremiah and Lamentations, Ezekiel and Daniel. You'll find it. We're going to go to chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. Now, tonight I want to talk about how God strengthens our faith. You know this, that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are called to walk by faith and not by sight. And that's very important. We need more faith these days. The world is getting darker. And the devil wants us to walk by faith. He wants us to make all of our decisions based upon what we can see and what we humans can think. And God is calling us to a higher plateau. The air is cleaner up there, folks if we walk with Jesus by faith. And our faith needs to be in His written Word. That's where our faith is put. And tonight we're going to look at how it is that God will strengthen our faith. And I have two verses in chapter 1 I'd like us to read. And it's a little bit odd when you, uh, when you read it. You know, how does this apply to faith? But I, I hope to show you that in just a little while. Uh, verses 6 and 7, and they contain some of those um, names that we're not too familiar with. Okay, so uh, verses 6 and 7. So we'll, we'll read these um, two verses and then have a word of prayer together, okay? Let's begin in verse 6. Now, among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. How does that strengthen faith? <laughs> well, I hope to show you that in just a little bit. So would you close your eyes with me and let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Help us to increase in faith. Lord, increase our faith. Help us to be able to walk with You. This world is getting worse. More and more we, we see and hear things on the news and actually in person, things that uh, make us believe that the tribulation can't be too far off. Father, for whatever time, years, months, weeks or days we have left. Help us to walk by faith and to do Your will by faith and not by sight. Too many Christians are falling for the trap of sight and help us to walk by faith. Now bless tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, let's take a look, shall we, at what we've got before us. The, these are familiar names. Uh, Daniel, we all know, the book's named after him, Daniel. But his three friends, uh, do you normally know them by their Hebrew name or by their Babylonian names? When you think of the three Hebrew men that were thrown into the fiery furnace, furnace what, what names do you think of? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Those are the three names. Now, uh, when I was um, in Bible college, I, I heard, maybe you've heard this too, a cute little way to try and remember those three names. Uh, shake the bed, make the bed, and to bed we go. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, the Hebrew names, Hananiah, 
means God loves me. Now that's a good name, Ananiah. God loves me. I like that name. The name Mishael means God is special. God is special. So we have God loves me, God is special. And the third name, Azariah, God helps me. God helps me. Now the, uh, the parents back then, the godly ones anyhow, they gave these special names to their children to help them in their relationship and their walk with God. All names mean something. Your name means something. Maybe we don't know what it means, but at one point it meant something to someone and they came up with that name. But we have three names here before us tonight and they mean God loves me, God is special, and God helps me. What the devil tries to do is he tries to take the focus off of God. This is what the devil is good at. He takes our eyes and puts them on other things. Now those other things sometimes are good things, but the bottom line is he gets our eyes off of the Lord Jesus. He takes the emphasis, the focus off of God and puts the emphasis and the focus of our lives on other things. That's what Satan is very good at. And what Satan tries to do is destroy the truth of God loves me he tries to destroy the truth that God is special and he tries to destroy the truth that God helps me. He will try to destroy these truths in our lives. Now, how does he do that? Well, we can see there was a name change. And when these three, four men, including Daniel, when they all got to Babylon, along with all these other Jewish men and women, their names were changed. Interesting, isn't it? That these are the heroes. And here, the, uh, the prince of the eunuchs in verse 7, he gave these names. And of course, to Daniel, he gave Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, he gave Shadrach. To Mishael, he gave uh, Meshach. <clears throat> and to Azariah, he gave Abednego. Say, what do these names mean? These were the names of pagan gods. Wow. Having your name changed from the one and true God, the one and only God, and something about the one and only God, and having your name changed to Something about a pagan deity. A pagan deity. Now people still use the names of pagan deities for their kids today. That still is a practice going on around the world. The, the mom and the dad are involved in a pagan worship, a pagan religion. Something that is other than the one true God. And they'll take some aspect of their pagan deity and they'll name their child, their son or their daughter. In connection, they'll connect their son or daughter with a pagan deity. Now, my opinion only, but if I was raised in a pagan religion and I had a name that was pagan, and I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, I think I would want to change my name. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, Saul was a persecutor of the Christians. And when he got saved, he changed his name. He changed his name to Paul. Now in his case, he wanted to to take a humble approach. He wanted to take the low road. I don't know if that's the correct term. But the word Paul means little. And so he took this name, I believe, to show that he was really little. 
compared to Jesus Christ. So a name, I think, is, is important. And what the devil did here through the prince of the eunuchs was give names to these three brave, godly Hebrew men. And listen, truth be known, we remember these guys by their pagan names rather than their godly names. Hmm, I wonder if that's so good. <laughs> Maybe we, we should be trying to remember them by their godly names rather than their pagan names. But this is what the devil is, is very good at doing. Do you remember in the book of Ruth? Do you remember reading the book of Ruth, Naomi? And the name Na- Naomi means pleasant. And that's something good. Well, she went off, her and her husband and two boys, they went out of the will of God, they left the promised land, and they went to the pagans. And they thought, well, the pagans have got it pretty good. Let's go over there. And so they went over to the land of the pagans. And they were there for a few years. Their boys married pagan girls. Her husband died. Both her boys died. And she's, she's angry. She's in bitterness. So she's going to leave and go back to the promised land. And of course, the, the two daughters want to come. And she says, no, you know, go. Go find yourself husbands. One of them went back, but the other one didn't. What was her name? The one that didn't go back, what was her name? Ruth. That's who the book was named after. And that's when Ruth said, you know, whither thou goest, I will go. Thy God shall be my God. Remember that? That's wonderful, isn't it? But when Naomi came back and her townsfolk said, Naomi, she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Naomi meant pleasant. Mara meant bitter. And she changed her own name. Now, I don't know if that was an official name change. I don't think she officially did that, nor do I think she, she kept that Mara name, really. I think that she was just bitter. And sometimes people get angry and bitter at God. When things don't go their way, the way they think they should go, they blame God. But God, in His love and mercy, knows what He's doing. Now, truth be told, Naomi and her husband and her two boys, they were out of the will of God. When they left the promised land, they went over to Paganville. They were out of the will of God. And so they kind of reaped what they sowed. But that's for another sermon. Here tonight, we've got a name change going on. And I think the devil inspired the prince of the eunuchs. And now the prince of the eunuchs didn't realize he was being moved of the devil to do this. This is just something he wanted to do. He thought he was going to bless them. Here, let me give you pagan names. It'll help you in our society. You'll fit in better. People won't uh, you know, get a funny look on their face when you tell them these Hebrew names. But when you tell them these Babylonian names, then they'll smile. They'll understand. So perhaps the prince of the eunuchs thought he was doing something good. I think, though, the devil was behind this. But the emphasis, the bottom line is, Get the emphasis off of God and onto other things. In this particular case, it was onto pagan gods. But you know, the devil will try and get your emphasis and my emphasis off of God and onto worldly things. We live in a very worldly society. Canada is largely uh, money driven. We want the good life, we want the wages, the paychecks, we want the benefits. We want to to own our house. We want to win the lotto. We want to wear the nicest and drive the nicest and eat the nicest. And Canada's like that. And so it fosters this sort of worldly mentality. And the devil's right there to try and work on Christian after Christian. And if the devil can get a Christian's mind off of God and onto things of the world, he's won. He's won. It's like that, that Christian no longer has armor on out in the battlefield. It's like they're, they're standing there in their, their pajamas or, or in their underwear or something. They've got no defense. And they're easy targets to pick off. And so the devil will try and get our emphasis off of God and onto wages and money. Off of God and onto popularity and pleasure. Off of God and onto sports 
and on to um, uh, games and on to uh, uh, thrills and chills and, and frills. He'll try and move the emphasis off of God. That's what the devil does. And we have to be wise, wise as serpents. We have to be on guard for this. This is what the devil was trying to do here. Now, by faith, the Christian keeps his or her eyes on the Lord. By faith, the Christian keeps believing the truth. Now, let's move along in the story here. God demonstrates the truth as true. We're going to go to chapter 3, so just a page or two to the right. And it isn't too long before trouble starts to brew. Now remember, the whole purpose of the message tonight is God strengthening faith. And in chapter 3, we've got um, uh, a, a lot of problems here. We'll pick up in verse uh, 12. This is the story, of course, of the golden image, the fiery furnace, right? This is what these men are most famous for. So verse 12, There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Here they go. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Notice these three Jewish men were given the pagan names of pagan gods. Gods that Nebuchadnezzar worshipped. And of course, these guys, even though they were, they were given these names, they still retained their own names. They still kept their focus on God. They didn't let their eyes come off of the Lord and onto the, the world around them. Where were the other Jews at this point? There were thousands of them there in the kingdom of Babylon. Where were they? He set, Nebuchadnezzar set up the big golden statue and said at the sound of all the music, everyone fall down. Bow and worship this. Where are all the other Jews? Bowed down. They're all bowed down. And there's Hananiah and Mishael and or Meshach and Abednego. No. <laughs> I can't even get them right. <laughs> Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Yeah. These fellas stood they wouldn't bow down. They stood tall. And so the accusers came to the king and said, O king, there are these three Jewish men and they're not worshiping your gods. They're not bowing down to the statue. You made a decree. Next verse. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury. Now remember, Nebuchadnezzar was not a nice guy. He was very ruthless. Uh, it was nothing to him to cut a person in pieces. So, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? And so... Satan brought trouble for these men trying to live for God. He brought accusations. Uh, the devil will do the same thing with us. There will be people that will maybe try and accuse you of something you didn't do or accuse you of, of evil motives. It happens. It happens. I've had that done to me more than once. Someone will accuse me of an evil motive or accuse me of something I haven't done. Well, I don't get down and play dirty with them. I keep my focus on the Lord. The Lord says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Now that's good news for us. Because sometimes people stronger than us are able to cause accusations and cause problems and trouble. What do we do? Well, we can fret and worry and, you know, inside our, our gut we can get feel like a sick feeling or we can give it over to God and the Holy Spirit will give us peace. If we pray and we continue to give it to God. 
What did these men do? They stood firm. You know, sometimes Satan will bring sufferings. He'll bring losses. And um, it's during this first part when the trouble comes that you will, will often won't find God's love, God's specialness, and God's help. Remember the three names. God loves me. God is special. God helps me. Those three names. When trouble is first happening to you, those three qualities seem to be gone. And the devil takes advantage of that. But this is a trial of your faith. When trouble first comes, Satan is right there to whisper in your ear, you see, God doesn't really love you. You see, God is not really special. You see, God is not really going to help you. And he whispers those things in our ears and whispers them to our heart. He tries to get us so we take our focus off of God and we put it onto the world and do, and do worldly things or react in a worldly way. And that's exactly here what the devil was trying with these three men. He was trying to put pressure on them so that they would cave in. So they would say, O oh, king, forgive us. We didn't understand. You know, we had earwax in our ears or something. We didn't hear. We'll do it this time. We'll, we'll bow down. Everything is going to be okay, O oh, king. You know, don't, don't get all ruffled. Things are going to be just fine. You'll see. The thing is, when trouble comes, when God allows for Satan to bring some trouble into our lives, we must continue by faith. We must press on by faith. Now this, I think, is what these three men did. Um, verse 15. Here, Nebuchadnezzar said, Now, if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, butt, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? Wow, that's pressure on these three fellows. And Nebuchadnezzar, as I mentioned, was a ruthless guy. He had no qualms whatever to carry this out and throw human beings live into a fiery furnace amidst their shrieks and cries and watch them burn. He would have eaten popcorn at that, that moment and enjoyed the show. He was that kind of guy. And this was pretty strong stuff. Nebuchadnezzar had conquered every nation in the then known world, including Judah. And these guys came out of Judah. And so he says, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? Now, watch what we find here. Verse 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and He will deliver us out of Thine hand, O King. But if not, be it known unto Thee, O King, that we will not serve Thy gods, nor worship the golden image which Thou hast set up. We're not going to do it. God is able to deliver us. He can deliver us out of Your hand. But if he decides not to, we are not going to bow down. We are still not going to bow down. We've thought it through. We've discussed it. We've prayed. We've committed our cause to God. That's what we're going to do. That's, that's what they did. You see, they continued by faith. They sure didn't continue by sight, did they? There was nothing good to look at. Just a fiery furnace staring at him. wonder what looked worse. Nebuchadnezzar's face or that fiery furnace. They continued by faith. They knew they were doing the right thing. They knew they were pleasing God by not bowing to this crazy image. They knew that that was the right thing to do. And they were determined to do it if it cost them their lives. They continued by faith. 
And now, here's the, the exciting part. Let's pick up here in verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed. So his face really changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. You know, I think this was a brick kiln. There were different kinds of furnaces back then. Of course, little ones that you bake bread in, bigger ones that they would refine gold in, and great big ones that they would fire the bricks in. And I think this is the one that they used back then. It certainly would have been out there in the... uh, uh, kind of the the open plain where where he had everyone brought in to, to bow down to his statue there. And so this thing was designed to, to be heated to a certain temperature. But he commanded that it be heated up seven times. And so they must have thrown a lot of coals in there and with bellows or something blown on it to get the heat really, really hot. And it became kind of a bomb uh, in, in a fashion. We'll see here. Verse 20, He commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, he didn't need the most mighty men, but he did this anyhow. And to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats and their hosen and their hats and other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because The king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot. Look what happened. This furnace became like a bomb, sort of. The flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you know what? Nebuchadnezzar didn't even care. He was a real brute. He was a beast, wasn't he? A real monster. His most mighty men... Maybe there was three of them, five of them. We don't know how many. Let's say there were three of them. Great big doozers, his most mighty men, were instantly fried in that, in that the fire that leapt out when they opened the door. Whoosh! They were fried. They were killed, destroyed. Those men might have had families, wives, and children. Nebuchadnezzar didn't care. No mention here whatsoever. It made zero effect on them. And uh, verse 23, these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt. Now underline this in your Bible. Take your pen or pencil. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. I think Jesus came and met them there in that fiery furnace. I don't have any other explanation. I think that God would not see His children destroyed like that and dishonored. He stood up for them. They stood up for him. He stood up for them. You see, here these men were decided to live their lives for God. They were given pagan names of pagan gods. And then one day trouble came. There was an opportunity for them to bow. And that will be the end of it. But of course they would have lost their testimony. They would have been mocked and ridiculed. They wouldn't have been able to live with themselves, I think their conscience would be bothering them so much. They wouldn't have any future emphasis uh, or um, influence with uh, the unsaved, but they decided amongst themselves, we're going to stand. We're not going to bow, even if it costs our lives. The devil put the pressure on them, but they wouldn't bow. So the king just exploded in fury, And he had them cast into the fiery furnace, but they still didn't bow. They still didn't say as they were dragging them off. They didn't cry, oh king, we changed our mind. Oh king, okay, you win, we'll bow. Nothing, none of that. They they were committed to the Lord. Cast into the fiery furnace. But instead of burning them up, 
And God met them there. All of a sudden, they had an experience that you and I wish we had. Imagine that. Many a Christian says, boy, I wish I could have been there and been in that fiery furnace and walk around with, with the Lord Jesus. What a story to tell. What an amazing thing. God will be found and with new closeness. You know, even our Lord Jesus Christ was tempted of the devil. You know that. After he had fasted, he was hungry. After 40 days, the devil came to him and tempted him. And he came off victorious. And angels came and ministered to him. Well, now, the three Hebrew men had a shining testimony. They wouldn't bow. They wouldn't bend. Now they had a great testimony. And the same will be true with us. The devil will be allowed to bring in some kind of testing temptation. Chances are you're not going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. But it might be something else. Maybe they'll threaten you with the job loss. Maybe your health will come in jeopardy or something. I don't know. But the devil will be allowed to, to do something. And if you bow, you might never get back up. But if you stand true for the Lord, your faith will be tested. He'll meet you in the God trial, you in the fiery furnace. And then you will really know the truth of Hananiah, God loves me. And Mishael, God is special. And Azariah, God helps me. God loves me. God is special. God helps me. You'll have a story to tell. And of course, your faith will go sky high. Let's go to the New Testament, to the book of Romans. We're going to finish here. Romans chapter number 8. Would you go to that chapter with me now, please? Chapter number 8 of Romans. Now I'd like if you would read along with me. A few verses here, starting at verse 35. You folks at home, you read along with us, okay? Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 35. Let's read now together. Here we go. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now, I want you to notice once again verse 38. For I am persuaded. The word persuasion means to be convinced by proof. That's what it means. If you're persuaded, then you have been convinced by certain proof. Now, what was the proof? Well, it was the difficult times you went through. That's what it was. Uh, First Peter uh, talks about, it says, uh, Beloved, think it not strange considering uh, to, uh, the, the, um, the fiery trial that you'll go through. In First Peter chapter 4. Uh, Psalm 23 the psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You get the idea? In your life and in my life, there's going to be some shadowy valleys. There's going to be some fiery trials. There might be some sort of, if I can use the expression, fiery furnace that you'll be called upon to go through. Now maybe some of you have already come through this sort of thing. And what God wants to do is to strengthen you and make your spiritual muscles strong, strong. And He'll do it through the fiery trials. Because it's in the fiery trials you will find Jesus Christ. 
Just like the three Hebrew men found the Son of God right there in that fiery furnace. So you and I, when we stand for the Lord and we have to pass through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. That's how it works, folks. How is God going to strengthen our faith? Well, we've learned about Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and we can know these things in our heads that God loves me, God is special, God helps me. We can know that theologically in our head, but it isn't until we walk the lonesome road and through the dark valley and through the fiery trials and we find, yes, He really is there. And what this experience does is it makes us strong in faith. Faith, remember, is trust in what God says. That's our faith. We put it in the Scriptures, in what God says. We're now able to come boldly to the throne of grace. We now have the faith to know that God is there, that He does help us, that He is special, and He does love us. We know this now. The meaning of those three Hebrew names helps us to have strong faith for what may lie ahead. This month is a month of faith. It's faith promise. We need strong faith to say, Lord, what wouldst Thou have me to do? Thank the Lord for the times of trial and testing we go through. Praise the Lord because it's through those experiences that we find the presence of Jesus. And now we know He really does love me. He really is special. And He really does help me. You know, there's been so many, many men and women down through the last 2,000 years that have lived their lives by faith and have stories to tell. All you need to do is go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, the hall of faith, and start looking at some of them. This man, that man, the other man, this lady, that lady, different ones who by faith did these amazing things. This is missions month. We're talking about supporting these missionaries who will help win souls where we are not able to. And many, if not all, of these missionaries have stories to tell. We have a missionary that we're, we're bringing in, and this missionary has a lot of very interesting stories he's going to be sharing with us in a conference. The conference is at the end of, of uh, this month. And I want to encourage you, make plans now to attend the conference. It'll be a Wednesday night, a Thursday night, a Friday night, a Saturday. Uh, I believe it's Saturday in the afternoon, isn't it? Does anyone know? Well, we'll figure it out. I think it's Saturday afternoon because we have food in there. So, got to get some food. And then, of course, there's Sunday. So, that's the conference. And the conference will bless you so much. But we need faith. Many of these uh, missionaries, Adoniram Judson, Hudson Taylor, uh, William Carey, George Grenfell. On and on the list goes. Men and women with stories to tell. You know, our dear sister Roman, she's in Ethiopia. And the the country's going through turmoil. Kind of like anarchy. And there's a bit of a war going on. It's getting closer to the town where she's in. Already, She's got stories she can tell. And already she's finding the presence of Jesus Christ. I hope it doesn't happen, but she may have to leave the mission field and come back to Canada. And if that happens, we're sure going to get her to share some of those stories with us. Won't that be exciting to hear what she has to say? But God is with her and God will protect her. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. They say, if you know anything about the Vikings, they were a real rough and tumble, hardy kind of an adventurous lot. Nothing seemed to stop the Vikings. But they say, there's an old saying, the north wind made the Vikings. The opposition, the resistance, 
the troubles they had. They say the north wind made the Vikings. And really, it's the trials of life that make the Christian. Let's pray now. Our dear Father, none of us want to run into trials, temptations, suffering. None of us want to do that. But Lord, in your infinite wisdom and mercy, as we walk the road with Jesus, sometimes he would have us walk through the valley of the shadow. And that's okay. We can go anywhere with Jesus. I pray, Father, for any of us here tonight in the auditorium or those watching over the internet who may be going through a bit of a rough time, please encourage them to know that it's for the strengthening of their faith because you have even greater things for us to do. So, Lord, get to yourself the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.